Good evening, everyone. My name is Brianne Colantonio, or Baez Colantonio, recently married. And I'm going to be doing the parent training tonight on ABC data collection. All right, so an outline of what we're going to be discussing today is we're going to be doing what ABC data stands for, what ABC in particular, common behaviors that your BCBA for your child um, may be tracking, and that's not inclusive. It can include more behaviors, less behaviors, different types of consequences, so how we use in ABA behavioral terms on how to define what happens, um, identifying the ABCs, types of the ABC data sheets, uh, your turn, so that'll be your turn to try. C stand for. All right. In short, it means A stands for antecedent, B stands for behavior, and C stands for consequence. I'm going to go further detail for each of those. So, all right. Antecedent is the events or actions or circumstances that occur prior to a behavior. So this could be that a demand was placed. It could be the removal of a preferred item, such as if Johnny has a little brother and his little brother takes away his iPad when he's in the middle of playing with it. Or it could be mom or dad saying, okay, it's time for dinner. It's time for you to give me your iPad. So that's a common one for a lot of our kiddos. And then any kind of sensory disturbances. So this could be loud noises if they're in a shopping mall or something and there's a lot of loud noises happening. It could be bright lights. It could be some, the environment's too hot or too cold because we know that when we get too hot or too cold, it could lead to some behaviors from ourselves. And then um, also the physiological state of a uh, child or anyone really. So illness, so we have had a lot of germs going around, so I'm sure some of the parents have observed that. Um, if they're hungry, if they're tired, that's just a list of a few of them. All right, and then behavior. That's really what we're all here for is that's anything that a person or an organism does that can be measured. So um, there could be physical movements such as clapping, running, hitting, standing, doing jumping jacks, dancing, um, vocal verbal behavior. So talking, whispering, making noises like screeches or groans yelling, and then eating is even a behavior. Breathing, when you breathe, it's something we can measure. We can measure how many breaths you take in a second or in a minute. So that's actually a behavior that someone's doing. And then um, playing, so how many minutes a child engages in play. All right, and then the C stands for consequences. So that's um, the environmental events or the stimulus that immediately follows a behavior. So antecedent was before behavior, consequence is after the behavior. So examples are, um, it could happen from another person. So that could be giving praise. It could also be giving reprimands. It could be tickles from another person. So it could be physical or vocal. Um, there's also access to something after the behavior occurs. So a toy, food, um, access to a room or environment, so that um, hurting oneself. So this is actually a lot of times what I'll later go on to is natural consequences. So if someone runs and they fall and they get hurt, that's a consequence to what happened with their behavior. And then um, so satiation, so that means that they're no longer hungry or they no longer want access to that whatever item or something that they had before because they're tired of it in layman's terms. So your first question for your paper is, um, this is the term for the environmental condition that happens before a behavior occurs. Is it A, antecedent, B, behavior, or C, consequence? I'll give everyone a chance to write down their answers and think about it. Okay, I think everyone's done. So it's antecedent. Does anybody have any questions? So antecedent is what happens before the behavior. Anyone feel comfortable with that? Okay. All right. 
next we're going to discuss what are some behaviors that the bcbas commonly track and i have the little disclaimer that i mentioned before that this does not mean your child engages in these behaviors these are just common ones that we track um, what we commonly consider problem or challenging behaviors um, your child's definition can also be different because I'm going over some brief definitions in case you hear your BCBA refer to something and you're not sure what it means. It kind of gives you, you know, a brief kind of overview, but always refer back to your child's BCBA. Their treatment plan should also have the definitions and their behavior intervention plan or BIP. Okay, so what can we track? Really anything. So that can be what we call manding or requesting items or for attention. Be some of our kids we track if they're walking with flat feet versus some of our kids toe walks. That means they're tiptoeing. Um, numbers of bites of food consumed for our children that have difficulty um, getting their appropriate nutrients. It can be eye contact. So a lot of our kids, we work on eye contact when they're talking to us or saying hello so we can track how often they look at us in the eyes. We can do um, number of demands completed. So if, that, if you have tasks, how many like questions they, they answer in a set amount of time. Toileting, accidents, or if they're going successfully on the toilet, that's a trackable behavior. Um, recognition of items and people. So if we were to hold up a card of mom or dad, can your child identify that's mom, that's dad, or that's an apple, that's a banana, and so forth, and then um, more. So now more of the challenging or a little bit more difficult behaviors. Um, they're listed in alphabetical order. I apologize, they're probably a little difficult to read. So we're going to start with aggression. So that's attempts or successes to do harm to others. Can anybody think of any forms of aggression? Throwing something if it's towards a person, yes. Uh, anyone else have any ideas of aggression that you might have observed, or whether it's your child or even a child at Walmart or somewhere else that you've seen another child? My pinch, slap. Pinching and slapping. So that's, like I said, it could be kicking. Uh, so that's. And then the next one is elopement. So that's leaving a sea area, the area surrounding a person without permission. So that's running away can be. And that could even be the child didn't ask and they see a toy across the room and they want to go and get the item. So it could be something like that that they didn't ask. And a lot of times the therapists and um, the behavior analysts track those behaviors because if they are out in public with you and they're at Walmart and all of a sudden they see a toy that they want, we're trying to reduce the, the risk of them running away to that toy aisle and getting the toy and then leaving the parents, which can put them in harm. So that's one reason why it's tracked. And then uh, flopping. So this is a common term that we use for any time of like it's an uncontrollable collapse to the floor. So a lot of times during tantrums we observe this or if they're not wanting to go like if you're saying, okay, let's go to the bathroom or let's go to bed and they don't want to and all of a sudden they just collapse to the floor or it could be collapsing out of a chair, so that's flopping. Um, and then motor stereotopy. So this is repetitive or rigid mo motion movement. So some of our kids have what we call flapping. It could be something that, honestly, I even engage in. It could be the tapping of your foot when you're sitting in a chair. It could be if you're in a rolly chair and you're someone who twists like this back and forth. That's motor stereotopy. And honestly, all of us probably have some form of motor stereotypy we engage in. It's not autism specific. It's not a child with another developmental disability specific. All of us probably engage in some sort of motor stereotypy. And it's kind of a coping mechanism that some of our kids have. Um, I know for me, I also, I hold a pencil and I flip, I do my pencil back and forth in my hands. Or if you're a clicker with a pencil or a pen, something like that. Um, mouthing. So that's putting objects that should not be in the mouth in the mouth or sometimes even up to the lips for some of our kids. So some of our kids like to eat small marbles and dirt and just putting it in their mouth. So it's mouthing. And then negative vocalizations or protests. I'm sure all of us have heard this before from whether it's our, your own children or someone else's child. No. It's a vocal protest, so when a demand's in place and they tell you no. 
Um, and then noncompliance, which that's any physical or vocal refusal. So that kind of goes hand in hand with um, protest. But this is when there's a demand in place. So it can also be some of our kids also might just shut down and not answer at all. They'll just sit there and put their head down and not answer. So that's not a vocal refusal, but it's a physical. Um, and then property destruction. So that could be your throwing of toys or other items. It could be kicking toys. It could be tearing up paper. It can be even just hitting their hand on a wall really hard, something like that. Um, SIB, or self-injurious behavior. So this is doing harm to oneself. So that's if your child or another child hits themselves in the face, if they bite themselves. They do harm to their own self. So not towards others, but towards themselves. Um, visual stereotypy, so that's the eyes focused on a single point in space for a prolonged time. This can sometimes be paired with motor stereotypy too. Um, it could also be like looking at mirrors or something else for a prolonged period of time or looking for like getting stuff in the right place so it looks, they want to see that light shine off of it. So that's a common behavior. And then vocal stereotypy, so that's repetitive sounds or words not in the context of an activity. So it could even be repeating questions after um, someone states a question or demand. It could be actually humming a lot. It can be making other sorts of noises. I'm sure if your child engages in it, you probably have an idea of maybe some of those behaviors. Oop. Well, next I was going to go into types of reinforcement. So um, that's, another, that's a type of consequence. So reinforcement increases the future frequency of behavior. And there's positive and negative reinforcement. And pop culture defines negative reinforcement differently than we do in behavior analysis. Um, a lot of times we think of negative reinforcement as, oh, you know, for instance, my mom said that I'll never get a girl because I'm too fat. And I'm just saying, that's something my husband's mom said to him when he was a child. And he considered that negative reinforcement. But I'm going to tell you that that's not really what negative reinforcement is. So um, positive reinforcement is the addition of something, and it increases the behavior in the future. So that could be your praise. It can actually be a reprimand if the child's just wanting attention and it, they keep engaging in the behavior in the future. It's for attention. It could be um, physical attention, hugs or tickles. It could be access to items or food. So anytime you're adding something to a situation and you see your child's behavior increase. And then negative reinforcement is the removal of something. So it's not punishing. So, um, so it's, you could be removing attention because some of our kids don't like attention and then they s stop or continue engaging in the behavior. Um, it could be removal of an aversive item. So I'll get into an example of that later and then the removal of like hunger. When you're hungry and you, let's say, eat an apple and you're no longer hungry, that's going to reinforce your future frequency of eating the apple because it's going to remove that hunger feeling which is a physiological state. And then next, punishment. So punishment decreases the future frequency of behavior. So positive punishment is the addition of something. Kind of the positive means add, negative means remove. So um, positive punishment could be actually attention. Some, like I said, some of our kids don't like attention. Um, it could also be um, physical attention. Uh, if a child gets spanked and it decreases their behavior. Um, it could be sensory experiences, so loud noises or getting wet. Because some of our children, we do desensitization if they don't like taking a shower, so it's kind of punishing for them to take a shower and stuff. And we desensitize them because we're trying to remove that as a punishing feature. Um, pain. I, pain is the addition to something. So, And then negative punishment is the removal. So. If, you if your child wants your attention is screaming and you just ignore and not give attention, that's punishing for them because you're removing that attention that you previously gave. Um, removal of a preferred item. So removing of the iPad. It could be removing, removal of a, even candy or something um, or a toy. All right, so additional consequences. So we have extinction 
which is no longer or permanently removing reinforcement from a behavior that was previously reinforced. So this is something that we do a lot for some of those challenging behaviors that children are more looking for attention for. So I'm just, and then so that decreases the behavior and it should decrease it to, our goal is z near zero rates. But if for whatever reason you provide reinforcement in there, it's gonna spike again because all of a sudden they're getting the access again to that reinforcement. And then what we term natural consequences. So this is like if you're running and you fall, no one else provided that reinforcement. It just naturally happens. You did something and it, sometimes we even consider, um, I know as a child I actually did it, I put my hand on a hot stove or my arm. I didn't know it was hot, but that prevented me from putting my hand on another hot item in the future, because that's a natural consequence. My mom didn't do it. Someone else wasn't involved with doing it, so it kind of naturally occurred. So it's a kind of a learning opportunity. All right. Functions of behavior. I find this important for my parents because it talks about, it kind of discusses about what are the reasons a lot of times why behavior occurs. So this is kind of the consequence side of things. So to escape or avoid an undesirable situation. So if taking a test or taking a bath, leaving the iPad. So that's escaping if they still have access to the iPad after you told them to not have the iPad or to relinquish it, they still have access to it, they're escaping that demand of it being removed. Um, social attention or any other kind of attention, so it could be the positive or negative, so removal or um, it can also be positive and negative in the sense of reprimand or praise. So for some of our kids it doesn't matter if you're yelling at them to stop something, they're still getting that attention from you. So that's why sometimes you'll hear your, ther your BA tell, your, um, tell you to just ignore it. Because it's probably because it's attention maintained. And I know sometimes that's very difficult to ignore too. Um, and then gain access to an item so to, or an activity, so to go outside. So this could be even asking, hey mom, can I go out and I play on the playground? And you say yes. They gained access, but they manded appropriately, which manding is requesting. So, and then access to sensory. So that's more so what we call automatic reinforcement. So that's enjoying the feeling. So some kids just like enjoy that feeling of the high five, or if they are engaging in the motor stereotypy, like I said, the twisting in the chair and stuff. That's more for them. It's sensory input that they really enjoy. All right, your next question for your paper is true or false, punishment increases the future frequency of behavior. <laughs> Give everyone a second. Okay, if you think it's true that punishment increases the future frequency of behavior, let's get, can you raise your hand? Okay, if you think it's false that punishment does not increase the future frequency, so it doesn't increase. Oh, I say true. You say true, so it increases? Okay. Yeah, it depends on the situation. As adults and individuals, uh, they perceive, you know, they accept it or perceive it. Okay. All right. So it's actually false because reinforcement is what increases. So even if you're yelling at them and you're providing a reprimand, you're still going to be reinforcing the behavior if the behavior increases. Punishment is going to decrease future frequency. So, yeah. And I'm going into some a little bit deeper of some things compared to maybe some previous trainings did on ABC data because I'm just wanting to make sure the parents are aware of maybe how their actions are influencing and why is it when I yell at him he still does it. It's probably because it was actually reinforcing to him instead. So, 
All right, identifying the ABCs. All right, so in this situation is that the antecedent is Sylvia sees the vending machine. So her behavior is that she inserts the dollar bill and presses the vend button for her food or soda of choice. So the consequence is outcomes the crunchy, satisfying snack that she wants. So this would be positive reinforcement because there was an addition of something added. So it increases her behavior of when she goes up to a vending machine and she puts coins in, or dollar bill in, in this case, that something will be delivered. All right, now this is the opposite. So the snack that's coming out got stuck, which we've all seen that happen or had it happen to us. So what does she do? She bangs on the machine and she shakes it. And out comes the snack, the snack falls. So in this case, it's still positive reinforcement because the snack came, but it's actually going to reinforce her every time that or a snack's stuck. She's going to first try to shake and bang on the machine to see if it comes out. Now, if the snack didn't come out, she wouldn't have gotten that reinforcement. So it kind of shows that even when you're doing something that's maybe not quite right and you get the consequence or the end result that you wanted, you still might engage in it. All right, now this one, it's raining outside. So let's say it begins to rain. So before you go outside, or even while you're outside, you open up your umbrella. When you open up your umbrella, you no longer get wet, theoretically speaking, because Florida rain doesn't always work that way. But so if you're no longer getting wet, that's actually negative reinforcement because it's removing of that aversive stimulus, that rain, you getting wet, it's a removal of it. Now, all right, let's say that there's a wet floor sign in the middle of the airport and you're running late for a flight. So you decide to run through the area that's a wet floor and you fall and hurt yourself. I'm sure all of us, or at least I can consider, I've, in, I've walked through a wet floor when it says a wet floor sign. We've maybe done it in our own kitchen if we've walked wash the floor and then we realize we need to get something. So if you were to slip and fall and it got in pain, would that increase or decrease your likelihood of walking through a wet floor in the future? Decrease. So that's why it's actually punishment and it's positive punishment because it decreases and it's the addition of that pain, it's the addition of something. All right. So. All right, it's Sunday and you see a Chick-fil-A and you're maybe not familiar that Chick-fil-A is not open on Sundays. So you go up to the door and you try to open it. The door does not open. And then you maybe realize at that point that the sign says that they're not open, but it's actually negative reinforcement because you didn't get any kind of, or negative punishment, sorry, because you didn't get anything for that behavior. It was the removal of being able to go into the Chick-fil-A and smelling the nuggets or getting whatever you want. So it's the removal of something. I was trying to do some examples that you guys would maybe be familiar with, not just kid specific. All right. So I don't know if everyone's gotten an ABC data sheet sample or not. Who's here? Um, they're situated. Oh. <laughs> so I'll wait till everyone's situated because I'm going to go over. Okay. Okay. All right. So it's front and back. So this is the first one. This one's more of a checkbox style. And I know I personally send this one home to my parents on a weekly basis. Um, so pretty much it has the antecedent. So I'll step over here. So antecedent's like just before what happened. Um, so it tells you just before and then antecedent. So the first option is asked or told him or her to do something. So that's placing a demand. Um, and then the second one stopped doing one activity and started doing another one that he or she prefers. And then the next one's attention um, was given to someone other than him or her. So let's say there's a brother or sister at home and you were giving attention to your child and all of a sudden you turned your attention to little brother or little sister, or older brother and 
older sister so that kind of situation and then there's alone or doing something by him or herself to be playing by themselves watching t v something where no one else is really interacting with that kind of all by themselves be reading a book and then there's interrupt an activity that he or she likes so that kind of can go actually asking and interrupting can kind of go together because you can ask them to maybe they're on the i pad you can ask it's time for dinner time to go to dinner and then so you're interrupting that i pad time and you're also giving them a demand so and then kept um him or her from getting um or doing an activity that they like so that could be you know it's time for dinner so no you can't play with the i pad right now situation and then other can be anything else that you find that's happened that you can think about that might be something that happened before it could be that they're sick at home or um, you can even do that maybe they just had a toileting accident something like that um, they're even though it would happen just before but let's say they're playing with blocks and their block tower fell because sometimes that's a big antecedent for some of our kids if something if that they're doing breaks or falls apart or doesn't go their way and then the behavior so what did he or she do I like to leave this blank for my parents but some BA will fill it out in advance with their behaviors that they commonly track for your child but this you could just list up what they're doing it could be whining it could be you know it could even be refusal it could be running away to use some more terms that behave or that parents will use compared to our elopement aggression negative vocalizations that would be the ones that probably your BA would write and I'm gonna move over here for the consequence so that's just after so it could be continue to do what you told him or her to do it could be ignored um, or did not talk to them or did not look at them um, it could be told um, him or her to stop or you maybe scolded or explained why gave like the rationale like oh you need to get off the iPad because it's time for dinner and you need to eat dinner so that way you grow into a big strong boy like kind of giving that really deep reasoning that some of our kids honestly ask for they're like they ask the big why question so um, and then there could be um, told him or her to ask properly so your child shouted iPad now and you instead said you can say can I please have the iPad so that's kind of telling him how to ask appropriately um, physically blocked or grabbed him or her to make him stop so sometimes this is used in public if your child's all of a sudden running away from you you can't just say oh wait let's a lot of times you're gonna grab them to stop them maybe from running out into the road or something that or at Walmart running to get that toy from the toy aisle um, and then there's told him or her to do something else could be your consequence um, and then made him or her clean up or put things back so if your child let's say that block tower fell and after that block tower fell then they decided to kick all the blocks all over the the living room so then you told them to clean up the blocks so um, and then there's took him or her somewhere else so that could be like at a store if the child's in the toy aisle and keep running away from you and then you instead lead them or if they're put them in a shopping cart and then bring them to like the clothing aisle where maybe they're less likely to run away from you and then the notes is describe what he or she did what happened how bad it was any if I didn't items were involved anything else that might be important and I understand these spots are kind of small so for my parents they know that they're more than willing to fill up extra space they know that they're able to write across it if they need to so it's just I find this easier because it's easier to kind of pinpoint what you're doing and then your behavior analyst can actually go into more so like identifying maybe what the um, function is that we went over earlier the attention the um, escape the access to items or the sensory experience and then on the back of your sheet there will be this one that's more narrative style so this one you would put maybe the date or time sometimes the time is important to us because if it always happens at 6 p.m. 
or maybe always happens right after dinner, then maybe there's a pattern of behavior in there that actually be, could play a role in the antecedent. And then there's this, this one includes setting events. So this is what's going on in the daytime. Are they tired? Do they not sleep well? Are they sick? Is even, let's say you have a new baby at home and the baby's been crying all day. Something like that um, could even be a death in the family or recently moving. Anything that you think would kind of stand out as something important that would maybe help your behavior analysts identify and help you identify if there's a pattern. And then the antecedent, so this is where you would write yourself what happened directly before versus doing those little check boxes. It could be, I told Johnny to clean up his room. That's an antecedent. So it's exactly what you told him to do. And then the behavior, so you describe your child's behavior here. So um, after, so you told him to clean up his room and now he is kicking and throwing toys threw himself on the ground and is crying. So that's actually, it could be a definition of a tantrum, but it's a kind of a way that you're describing everything that's happening. And then consequence, what did you do? It could be that I ignored and let him play. It could be whatever you actually did. It could be, I made him clean it up. It could be, I ignored until the tantrum was over and then he cleaned up. So it could be whatever you did or if someone else did. If all of a sudden little brother or sister comes over and starts hitting him because he's screaming and crying because he's too loud for them, that's a consequence too that happened. And then the function, this is something that you could attempt to fill out. Um, otherwise, the, your behavior analyst for your child can help you identify that function like I stated before. All right. All right. So now it's your turn to try. All right. This is not to be answered on the... The one sheets, this is for you to just try or you can kind of discuss it on our own here. Um, all right, let's say Samantha sees her little brother, Chris, playing with her teddy bear. She hits him on the face and he gives her the teddy bear. All right, so what do we think the antecedent is for that, for him hitting her? Playing by himself. Any other thoughts? So antecedent would be what happens before the behavior of him hitting. Okay. Go over to this. So that's actually, she sees the little brother playing with the teddy bear. So he, even though he is by himself, but she, he sees little brother. So the behavior is hitting the brother. And then the consequence kind of revealed it here. Um, my effects aren't quite working like they're supposed to, is getting the teddy bear. So on the ABC data sheet, if you did the narrative, you could write in seeing little brother with the teddy bear. Um, you can, that could be under other on the checkbox one. And then the behavior, hitting. That's aggression. And then consequence, what happened? They got the item that they wanted. Technically, isn't that, mm -hmm. wouldn't the consequence be the intervention and correcting her behavior? Like taking the teddy bear away or mm -hmm. Well, for this, because I didn't list anything that happened after, it wouldn't be the consequence. But for this specific, so the first part is sees little brother Chris playing with teddy bear, then hits him, and then he gives her the teddy bear. But if you were to do any kind of corrective state, corrective actions after, it would actually, then that would be another consequence for it. And then you would see if there's, let's say your corrective action after, he gets the teddy bear, your corrective action is reprimanding and telling him to give it back. Then if he gives back the teddy bear, and then let's say you praise him for still giving it back because he still complied with your demand of giving it back. So that'd be a whole separate kind of antecedent behavior and consequence. So our behaviors become really entangled, unfortunately, and I understand it's difficult to sometimes disentangle. So sometimes the more data you give us or the more information, the better, because sometimes you'll go up to your behavior analyst, they'll be like, you'll be like, what should I do? What can it happen? And they'll say like, we'll take ABC data for it, or you need to explain it better. So this is kind of a way for right after it happens for you to kind of kick in and kind of record and remember what happens. And then you can maybe better refresh because 
we all know that some there's that bystander effect or maybe you forget something later on or you think you saw something different so this kind of is a way to kind of help cement that all right the second one for you to try is let's say Eric mom asks him to clean up his toys Eric cleans up his toys putting them all back in the correct places his mom gives him a piece of candy all right so what do you think the antecedent is Asked to pick up the toys. All right, and then the behavior would be from Eric, picking up the toys, and then what was the consequence? Piss of candy. So that one was maybe a little bit more simpler. So, because we always like to also reinforce when they do something that we ask. <laughs> Not, so that way you're always giving them attention, you're giving them a good attention. So, so. You guys did fantastic with that. So the antecedent was being asked to clean up. The behavior was him actually cleaning it up. Consequence was he got that piece of candy, which was uh, him getting access to an item in that case. All right, next one. Cody's dad asks him to mow the yard while he is at work. Cody plays video games all day and does not mow the yard. Cody's dad grounds him by taking away his video games. So this one might be a little bit more complicated, but a lot of teenagers, I feel like, engage in some of this behavior during those high school years, I guess I'll put it. So what do you think the antecedent is for this? Or would it be better for us to start with the behavior? Yeah. Ah. So... The antecedent is Cody's dad asked him, is what you guys are saying. And then the behavior is ignoring or playing the video games. And then the consequence? Yep. Yeah, the video game's taken away. So, or he gets grounded. Yep, you guys are doing great with this. So. Said so repetition is key, and your behavior analyst for your specific child will help you pinpoint the correct way of describing some situations and finding out what's going on. Whoop, well, that one automatically jumped to the answer for you. So, all right, this one is that Jenny and her mom are at Publix, and they're currently walking by the bakery. Jenny asks mom for a cookie, and mom says no. Now Jenny begins to tantrum, and Jenny's mom gets her the cookie, and Jenny stops tantruming. So for Jenny's tantrums in specific, that's kind of this later half. So what the antecedent for this was is that mom was saying no, and then her behavior was the tantrum, because, and then consequences, what did she get for that consequence? The cookie. So this is actually positive reinforcement for her, because she got that cookie. So in the future, if you say no, or if mom says no when you're going by the Publix bakery for that cookie, and she's learned that if I tantrum, eventually mom will get me that cookie. So that's kind of something that we can just recognize in ourselves. This is actually an example that when I was in graduate school, one of my professors referred to us a lot. It kind of creates a trap, which I'll actually go into. So for Jenny's mom actually giving her the cookie. So that's kind of um, this half. So Jenny's mom gives her the cookie, the last half. So what do you think the antecedent for mom giving her the cookie was? The tantrum. Very good. And then what was the consequence then? The tantrum stops. So this was negative reinforcement because now that aversive stimulus or that aversive environment of her child tantruming now stops. So she kind of gets that reinforcement of maybe these parents at the store are not, no longer looking at me like I don't know how to control my child because that's a very common phrase I hear from parents. Um, and so in the future, your child's tantruming, oh I know I can just give her the cookie and she'll stop. So it kind of is a, the parents learned how to avoid those aversive situations. So it kind of creates this trap. The child's getting what they want and parents get what they want. So that's why it 
that's kind of a little bit of ABA in a nutshell, so behavior. So it's kind of we work on that for in therapy. Well, if they're wanting that cookie, we're going to wait till they're done tantruming, and maybe they ask correctly or they do something that we want. We won't give them the cookie. So it's kind of we, and we'll work with parents on how to work on that at home or any other situation, like the iPad time. This could be used for iPad. They ask for an iPad. You say no. They begin to tantrum. They're like, okay, here, just take the iPad. Because that's another common story I hear from parents. So iPad is like gold for our kids. So all right, this is question three for everyone. So it's true or false. A child's behavior um, can lead to positive reinforcement for the child and negative reinforcement for the parent. So just think about that last situation we just discussed with mom says no to the cookie, child tantrums, mom ends up giving her the cookie. So, so and then also you can remember positive reinforcement is the addition of something and it increases the behavior. A negative reinforcement is the removal of an aversive stimulus or aversive item, whatever it is, and it still increases behavior. I see some parents thinking. I want to give everyone a chance because I know I gave you a little, this is a little bit more difficult. So what does everyone think? True or false? True. true. Very good. It is true. Because like I said, your, your child's being positively reinforced by that addition of that cookie, and you're being negatively reinforced by the removal of their uh, tantrum. So I just kind of wanted to show you some of that dynamic in there of what is kind of happening behind the scenes, what behavior analysts kind of observe. So. All right, I want to give time for questions because I know that this is a topic that parents might have questions for. So in conclusion, ABC stands for antecedent, which is what happens before the behavior. The B stands for B for behavior. Uh, and then C is consequence, so that's what happens after the behavior. And then ABC data in general can be helpful to identify the consequences and environmental conditions surrounding a behavior, and it can also help your behavior analyst identify patterns. So that's kind of how we determine the function. If every time when they tantrum, if they get access to whatever they wanted, then that tantrum function is going to be for access to something. If every time when they tantrum, the demand's removed, and they no longer have to brush their teeth, leave something, clap their hands, it could be any kind of demand you place, get dressed, take a shower. If they no longer have to do that after they tantrum, then it's escape from demands, this kind of example. So, all right, I want to leave time for questions. All right, any questions from anyone in particular on how to record the data? I can go over that a little bit more. You look like you have a question. Mm -hmm. The bit of, the bit of confusion that I have is, mm -hmm. um, and you can um, mm -hmm. uh, clarify for me, um, just like one of the, the last examples, um, child's crying at the market, she wants a cookie, mm -hmm. mom gives her the cookie because she wants her to stop crying. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's kind of where your behavior analyst will help you come up with the learning behavior. Uh, in this case, I was just giving examples of what happens and not necessarily always the behavior analytic consequence because sometimes we use larger terms and stuff. So in that case, it didn't solve the issue. 
for the child. But if instead the child tantrum and you just walked around Publix the whole time with the child tantruming until the child calmed down and the child never ended up getting the cookie, then no reinforcement was provided. Yes? Uh, we have a question from the chat room. Somebody wanted to know what the first question was. Okay. It's the first like, question on the sheet. All right. I could probably go back to that quickly for them while I answer. So question one. There you go. For the parent. Is that helpful for the parent, hopefully? Should be, yeah. Okay. So do you have any other questions about that situation, how I explained that if you just ignored the, the tantrum happening? I know that doesn't help in the moment, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if it gets out of hand, yeah. and, you know, I look at it, you're trying to embarrass him, embarrass him in a way where it needs to stop. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get that cookie. That's, so, that's just me. But not, Anita, okay, here, Julian, you know, yeah. nod. That's the thing is, a lot of our parents and a lot of you guys have been trained now in a lot of these behavior interventions that we use. So but for some parents, and even this could be for typically developing children, like your next door neighbor's child who maybe attends public school, who, as far as you know, has no types of disabilities or anything. Mom and dads might do that. That's not limited to autism. So. It's not limited to, I'm not going to say that's not limited to autism because, you know, normal, you know, children, they act that way. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's a, I was just kind of giving an example of what happens sometimes that it could happen or maybe it happened with the iPad or something or a parent's in the middle of a conversation and all of a sudden the child's running around and wanting all that attention and all of a sudden you just start yelling at them and like, fine, here, take, this, take the iPad or take my phone to play with the phone so that way the child kind of stays away. I've seen parents do that at Walmart or other or at a restaurant and stuff. So it's just kind of giving an example of what even as parents sometimes we don't realize what we're doing. So any other questions? Anything from the online comments? Nothing so far. We got that one. And okay. Good to go. So of course if there's anything behavior specific to your child, talk to your child's behavior analyst because I'm not your child's behavior analyst, so I can't tell you what's on their behavior intervention plan of how you're supposed to handle a certain behavior. I don't know what's on their treatment plan for their goals. And it could be a behavior that the behavior analyst doesn't even know about and needs to hear about. So that's why these ABC data sheets, because if it's something really out of the ordinary that you've never saw your child do before, it's really important to record this ABC data for us. So that way we can try to figure out what's going on. And then we'll record ABC data for what we see in therapy. If we see the same exact behavior occurring, we'll take our own ABC data. I know I'm taking ABC data weekly on all of my clients in my room, if we, especially if we see something new occurring. Like all of a sudden, if your child starts eating paper out of, it's like, why? Like, what is the reason? So we kind of record that antecedent. What happened before? Oh, they were told that they had to color this coloring sheet behavior was eating the paper after they no longer had that coloring sheet to color so it was the removal so kind of we kind of assess what happens in the situation what yes what if there's nothing that stands out that like let's say um, they just start hitting themselves in the head but mm -hmm. there's they're not being talked to they're not like what kind of things would you write down as the, the antecedent antecedent. Um, so if they're by themselves and all of a sudden you see, you could just write that they're by themselves or maybe what were they engaging. If they were playing with an iPad or something, that's for you, you probably think that they're playing by themselves, but still that's something. So even if you just say that they're by themselves and maybe describe like a little bit more of the setting event. So on the check boxes, there's something that says alone or playing by themselves. So that would be what you would check and then the behavior and then what did you do after. If all of a sudden they start hitting themselves, I'm sure the gut reaction is to stop, to block that, to, 
you know, physically stop them and maybe talk to them saying, oh, no, you don't hit yourself, because I know that's a common reaction or consequence that parents give. And then, like I said, anything else that you can provide your behavior analyst of what's happening in the environment that even if you maybe think it's minuscule, if maybe you were cooking dinner and they're in another room, maybe it was somehow related to the smell of the dinner or something or a sound. Like I said, if TV was playing in another room, our kids are very sensitive, even, so to speak, typically or as another, as a parent put it, normal kids, they could be sensitive to things that we have no idea that they're sensitive to. Just like us as adults, there's certain things that probably bug us that an outsider would not know, you know, if someone really does not like being in a cold room or a hot room, and that might play a role, um, seasonal changes. Sometimes even we see hurricanes coming, that changes our atmospheric pressure. And sometimes our kids notice those things and we see changes in behavior. So stuff like that that maybe you would think is nothing actually could be something. So try to that would be my suggestion is just kind of try to explain what's happening. So a narrative sheet, like the the one side would probably be helpful for that kind of situation versus the check boxes. Excuse me. Anything else? No. No. Hopefully this is helpful. I said I have my parents have one on I send out a parent communication log for my clients and I have it attached to the back so my parents always have access to one as long as they're outside of therapy. Um, you can ask any of your child's behavior analysts to provide one for you. I have actually extras up there right now because we didn't have, um, I printed off more copies than I should have, so I have extras if you want to take one home. Um, if you prefer a certain style, I recommend you try both. If you prefer a certain style, <coughs> mention it to your child's behavior analyst and like I so said, they could provide it. And for the checkbox mark ones, that's a template that we have on file and they can always type in the behaviors that they're tracking themselves. But what do you guys prefer right now, the check boxes or the handwriting narrative? Or is it situation specific? I like doing the check boxes. You like doing the check boxes? I do them every day with these. <laughs> so I appreciate yeah. that. So yeah. So that just shows right there, parents saying that they were able to get the help that they needed by documenting. Yes? I'm just curious, something that mm -hmm. might uh, be helpful to the parents, is there any program you'd recommend or an app on the phone maybe that they can use to help track this kind of a thing? Because most parents aren't going to be traveling around with mm -hmm. data sheets on them, but there's an app or something they can do. Even if it's oh. just you suggest taking like yeah. notes and a notepad, it might be a great way for them mm -hmm. to track it mobily mm -hmm. and they can do a little bit more active mm -hmm. themselves. I believe the Rethink, um, at least the website, I'm not sure what kind of apps available for the parents that Craig did his, his training on last month, where he talked about all the things that Rethink does. I believe it has an ABC portion in there, hopefully for parents. Otherwise, your notepad on your phone you can write down, just you could even do like a little narrative, like kind of how I did like the, the sentence with explaining like what happened before and after. You can do that on your phone. You can. Um, Class Dojo, I'm not sure if Class Dojo has an app for parents or if it's just an email, but it does have an app. There's an app for Class Dojo, so you can Class Dojo your child's behavior analyst when it happens. Like, here's something I observed. If you don't have something on your email, if you need any of your behavior analyst email, I recommend you ask them because I don't have everyone's email, unfortunately, memorized. So that's an option if you don't have the paper on you. Anything else? Questions, comments, concerns? Okay. I want to thank every parent for coming here tonight and everyone who's watching online. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>